So there we are coming to the final round table. Final round table. Let's move beyond GDPism. I never used this word before. <laughs> it's kind of a new word. Uh, beyond GDP as objective of public policy, we're maybe getting out of facts and figures and talking about human values here. Um, happiness, prosperity, human development, which is the reason why we are here, mainly, definitely. And it's really a great topic to finish this, uh, these two days working on competitiveness. And with us to talk about uh, this beyond the Jeep DPism, we've got the pleasure to have on our panel, on our panel His Excellency Lyongpo Loknat Sharma, uh, Minister of Economic Affairs of Bhutan. Most welcome. Thank you to be with us. Mr. Nabil Fami, former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Egypt. Welcome to you too. And His Excellency Excellency Jen Wenbing, Ambassador of the People's Republic of China in Switzerland with live translation. And to moderate this uh, panel, uh, Venina Faber from IMD, you are an economist and political scientist specializing on social innovation and holder of the Share for Social Innovation. The floor is yours, Venina. Good, so welcome everybody and it's an honor to be hosted uh, this distinguished panel to talk about going be beyond gross domestic products. So somehow we are going to talk a little bit about figures and numbers, but why we need to go further than that. And as you probably know, we all our economies are pretty obsessed with growth and with measuring gross domestic product. And usually as a rule of thumb, thumb is if we have two quarters of negative growth, we talk about the big R word that I'm not even going to mention in this uh, economy, global economy slowing down. So gross domestic product actually was created or was designed in, in the 30s and it responded to very particular challenges and it was much more useful even after the two world wars and Bretton Woods because our focus was recovering and reconstructing economies, uh, analyzing jobs and infrastructure and it responded to the particular challenges of the time. So when we look at gross domestic product, it's really a snapshot, it's a picture of all the goods, all the final goods and services uh, produced and traded in an economy within the boundaries of the country in a certain period. So we are really looking just at formal economic activity as a snapshot. When we talk about companies, we do not only look at their income statement or the flow, we'll also look at the balance sheet. We want to know what happens if they're creating wealth or what is in, the, uh, in their balance sheets. But when we talk about uh, macroeconomy or economics, we tend to look only at GDP. That measure is, the, the advantages is a simple measure, but it measures all the production from the supply side, also all the expenditures, and also all the income receiving an economy. But it leaves out this idea of building wealth. So economies have noticed that uh, GDP, especially if you look at decades or, or different periods, was very volatile. And that we were just looking at what we produce now, but we didn't understand what happened. And as you know, I have a certain bias. I'm from Argentina, so talking about volatility of GDP is kind of in my DNA. But so what we also want to analyze is, or want to see is, do we need to account what, not only do we grow, are we producing goods and services right now in this period, but how are we growing? So we have a, a wide variety of experiences here on how we go, uh, or how can we address and go beyond GDP in order not to measure just macroeconomic or if you want formal economic health, but actually talk about inclusive prosperity and happiness. Now, how can we embed of the right measures for policymakers that go beyond just counting and managing goods and services? So I will start with His Excellency Lokna Sharma uh, especially since the 1930s, Bhutan uh, has uh, worked on the Gross National Happiness Index. So can you tell us a little bit what was the need to come up with a different measure, how Bhutan goes be beyond GDP, and what kind of things you think uh, are not addressed by GDP and we need to account through happiness? Thank you. I'm, I'm totally privileged to be here. I'm honored. 
I'm flattered too when you mention GNH, but I might falter too. Bhutan is a very tiny country, least known, probably least developed. Everything, ill sites and the lowest sites we have. But again, you called me all the way here and you wanted me to talk to beyond the GDP. Well, I, I feel puzzled already. How, where should I start? Well, our, our thinking is that we are not competing with anyone and we are not also prescribing anything to the world. For us, Bhutan, what we wanted was, besides this materialistic well-being, there is a need to thread up, there, there is a need to harmonize, to loop developments into a holistic form where material well-being is there. Along with it, there is psychological well-being, cultural well-being, and spiritual, spiritual well-being also. So that the development focuses holistically. The development philosophy or the development need of the development of every country probably is to meet the aspirations of their people. Therefore, if we had to meet the aspirations of the people who are made of solid, liquid, as well as gases matter, they have mind and soul together, bones and cartilages together, probably they need all these things to be analyzed, the ecology on where how the human existence is there. So our thinking is that is why we say it's sustainable development. What does sustainable development mean? For us, it means gross national happiness. That is, at the end of the day, let's pursue something where our people will be happy, our country will be happy, and at the same time, we do have this economic development or whatever you want to call. That is why Bhutan has gone into this path of gross national happiness. We have been doing this since 1970s, and I would like to say that uh, we don't want to proclaim that everyone should follow this, but we are doing good in this. Uh, we are doing it, and we are following it. We have a central coordinating, a planning body called Gross National Happiness Commission, GNHC. It's called Gross National Happiness Commission. Then for policies to go into and to, uh, and to make the larger impact to the people, what we have is GNH tool, screening tool. Any policies, new policies we, we frame, any laws and regulations we try to frame, we test into this GNH screening tool. It has to go through this tool and we analyze from this tool whether this policy is ultimately going to benefit the people at large or not. And we also want to make sure that whatever we do now, we do now, it satisfies the present needs, but we also have something for the future generations. We do not take, decide everything and take away everything that future generations, generations need. Therefore, while doing this, uh, we had this gross national happiness, the uh, concept of gross national happiness, which is a uh, means, a process which is not an end to itself. Within that, we had four pillars where we used to take care of cultural diversity, social economy, environment and spiritual. We have nine domains under that. When we analyze our policies, tools, and legislations, we put into these nine domains. There are, uh, I don't want to explain you one by one, but it has living standard, good governance, education, health, ecology, community vitality, time use and balance, culture, psychological well-being, and things like that. Then we have 22 variables attached with it. Then uh, 22 indicators, and then we have some variables, 160 some variables also to how do we come, how do we check our policies are good or not. So this is how we are working, and we have been working since 1970. It's gaining popularity. I, I feel many eyebrows are raised, many critics are raised, many questions are raised, but the fundamental thing is that we have gone quite a far with this. We are applying this in the sustainable development sense and in the 12th plan, strikingly, if you see, our national NKRAs, 16 of the N NKRAs, which we have 16, perfectly matches with 17 goals of SDGs. The one we don't have because we don't have ocean and all, 16 hmm. perfectly match with it and it is not we created this. It just automatically matches. That, is, that means probably the world is also looking towards that. We don't know, but we are not, uh, I'm not a professor, I'm not a scholar. 
we are only being pragmatic that probably this is what we need. After a day's work, when you go to your house and retire, probably you want relaxes in there. And then uh, when you before sleep, oh, I did good today. Everybody tomorrow wakes them, ah, I want to do something good. Probably this is how everyone feels. And this is how we want to see it. And this is how we are looking towards it. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for reminding us that beyond GDP, we have also personal well-being, cultural values, and a holistic view of what it means a good living. So I would like to go to His Excellency Zheng Wenbing, Ambassador of Public Republic of China, to see how is this going beyond GDP uh, for public policy, given that China has been <coughs> one of the major drivers of growth and the economy is slowing down, and there have been a lot of uh, challenges from environmental perspective. Only, not, on, not even one week ago, we were here at this stage with alumni from, a, from the MBA talking how China can drive actually the green solutions and how it has embedded a lot of environmental issues in its policies. So how can you tell us what is China doing to go beyond GDP? We will have now simultaneous translation, uh, so just so, so you, the, the audience knows. Great. This GDP growth. 过去中国政府很重视改革开放四十年我们有一些两份 The Chinese government used to attach great importance to the growth of GDP uh, it's been 40 years since the reform and opening up of China. And uh, during these 40 years, for many years, we have witnessed the GDP growth uh, by second digits for several years. However, in 2012, we have seen that the GDP growth has slowed down in China and uh, coming back to a reasonable stage. <laughs> 转向高质量的发展。I have now proposed that we'll go back, uh, we'll shift from the high speed development to high quality development. 经过长达四十年的高速度发展,接近四十年的高速度发展,确实这个也带来了不少的社会问题,特别是环境问题。After 40 years of high speed development, Indeed, we see a lot of social problems, including environmental problems. For example, the pollution in some middle and uh, big cities in China uh, can be very serious now. So we have been more focused on 这个总体，这个发展，还有人民群众生活的改善，呃，充分的考虑在一起来制定国家的这个发展计划。That's now for recent years we focus more on the high quality development, and uh, other than the economic development only, we also account in the social development in whole, and also consider the improvement of people's life. 最近我们比较强调五位一体建设政治建设文化建设社会建设生态文明建设这五个方面形成一个总体叫五位一体来建设和发展 Recently, we proposed the concept of development in five prospects in total, which are the construction in economy, in politics systems, in culture, and in social development, as well as the ecological development. All this will be put together into a whole. This is Economic 
Economic development remains the first priority. While maintaining development in the economy, we also take uh, we take into consideration of other aspects such as the cultural development, social development, and especially the ecolog ecological development. So, in the past, China has focused on the Does this recent years China has attached great importance to the green economy? We also proposed the concept that uh, the lucid water and the clear skies are our valuable assets. We need only, uh, not only the resources and assets, but also the great environment, which is lucid waters and large mountains. One day we may end up rich, however, we live in a very highly polluted environment. This way we can't feel happy. Does the great environment will also be an indicator to measure our happiness? In the social respect, to maintain the development of GDP, we also need to make sure the harmony of the society. If the GDP is growing very fast, however, with the widening gap between the rich and the poor people, the society will become inharmonious, which will not be a solid foundation for the GDP growth. Excellent. So let me uh, point out, si, si. we are bringing some of the, these issues that it's not only about the speed, though we need to keep growing, but also taking account what before were considered just negative externalities, that was the ecosystem or in general nature, and also to take into account that it's not enough to grow, but we need to think how we grow because income inequality exists. So let me go to former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Nabil Fami of Egypt, uh, because you also your tenure as an ambassador was in a very challenging time in Egypt during 2013, 2014. So how do you think going beyond GDP can inform policies in a country like Egypt? And what kind of examples can you give us? Thank you. Well, let me start by saying that personally, I'm a mathematician by education. So I have a fetish for numbers. And I appreciate that ultimately, if you're going to have a criteria, you're going to go to a number. Uh, my career has always has been in public policy. So then you look at the number, and you see how invaluable it is without context, without understanding uh, the larger problems and the issues. If you add to that foreign policy, you see even how less important the number is in comparison to other contexts. If you take the Egyptian example, I would argue this is an this example which shows you the importance of GDP and the limitations of GDP. In 1952, we were a monarchy, and we were loaning money to the UK. We became a republic, and the economy started to go down initially, and then it went up in the mid-60s. Population was increasing. If GDP was going down consistently and population was increasing, then you have a problem. But even though it was increasing, it was increasing by government expenditure and not in the right places. Therefore, by the late 60s, early 70s, our capacities in the economy had diminished in terms of innovation, creativity. Uh, in 2011, we were growing at 8%, and we had a revolution. Sure. The revolution was not driven completely by economics, but it was definitely a component in that. And my point really here is, 
Is GDP an important criteria? Yes, but it tells us how much you spend and how much you've generated. It doesn't tell you how you spent it in the right areas and is the usage efficient even in those areas. 2013, we developed a new constitution and to try to deal with that, we did the sort of odd thing of trying to put actual percentages of the budget in the Constitution. Now, I don't support uh -huh. that because I think it's too rigid, but I understand the political message there. And they had percentage there for health services, a percentage that had to be spent on education, and a percentage on scientific research. So for me, GDP is important, but not enough. You can't do without GDP, and you can't stop with GDP. It's all about income distribution. And then, if you do that properly, it's the refinement of how you do that. And I would argue that as you move forward, uh, you really have to have the capacity to have an economic vision to determine where you're investing it. Uh, the first session this morning on digitalization, we're building a new capital. I'm frankly a bit hesitant about new capitals generally particularly when you have something as, as, as valuable as Cairo is. But the really impressive thing about this new capital is they're trying to digitalize it and make it as smart as can be and putting in new systems. Now, the problem here isn't the hardware. It's how do you develop the culture so that people depend on dealing with each other in that fashion and, and the technicality. So my, my answer to you is simply GDP is important, but definitely not enough. Excellent. As uh, um, Navi Fani, a uh, former ambassador, is mentioning, uh, we are facing new challenges. We're facing challenges of income distribution. We're facing challenges of digital disruption and creating smart cities. We have a new index here at IMD. We're facing uh, the economic or the ecosystem limits of our production. So how have the policies or current policies that your countries uh, are doing, if you want to mention, addressing these new challenges while still fostering growth? Because as you're saying, we cannot get rid completely, but we still need the speed, but the quality. Can you mention some? Sure. And I, I will start with you and then go. Yeah. What, one of the most important in my mind and the most challenging has been changing the educational system. Mm -hmm. We have se been seriously trying to, uh, to change the educational system from one where you follow the textbook, to one where we teach you how to think and you search for the information. That's involved changing curricula, it's involved changing how we evaluate students, and it's also involved changing the hardware, in other words, moving away from books to uh, tablets and so on. And it's caused a significant social tension because when you're talking about your children, people aren't used to change and it's not easy. But I think it's a major step forward. Now, what's important here is these are difficult structural decisions. They have to be sustained. They cannot be things we start and then we move back on. Uh, so I'm very impressed by that particular component, but I admit it isn't moving easily. And I would argue also there is, in, in, in my country, 65% of the population is younger than 30 years old. So there's a tremendous emphasis on youth employment. Uh, our unemployment has actually decreased significantly. Uh, it's now, I think, about 12, 11 or 12 percent. But the unemployment of educated youth is still too high. So trying to create an economy which deals with uh, that particular sector, because they're the majority, is important. And that's the responsibility of governments. They determine the policies that uh, determine how you spend or place the formats for how the money is spent. Great. So I think it's very interesting because start to think about how we grow and going beyond GDP goes to the structural side of the economy. And these are tough choices we need, Can we I need just to make. Say one yes. more thing and I'll be very, very, very brief. I have a seven-year-old grandson. 
And I took him to buy the newspapers. And he looked up to me and he said, old school. <laughs> <laughs> I went to his mother and I said, but your son just called me old school. Uh, so anyway, I went to my grandson and I said, you have to be aware of current events. And, and, and I went on and on. And he looks up to me and he says, in newspapers tell you what to read and how much to read. Electronically, you can decide what to read and how much to read. That's not exactly correct, but it's a new environment. And unless we deal with those minds, we will be missing an opportunity or, or facing major crisis. It's so, not about telling them. It's about helping them think. So how can we embed that new mindset into policies and going beyond at the country level? So let's see the example of China. Uh, His Excellency, what are the new measures? How uh, China is including uh, things that cannot go country, like you mentioned already, about the environment, about education, or about uh, different issues we have mentioned? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, China is facing this stage of adjustment. You go we are shifting from the high speed development to high quality development. During this period, we are facing a lot of challenges. Uh, Right now, China's overall GDP registered 13.6 trillion US dollars and the second in the world. At this high point, we are unable to maintain the fast speed development and it has to be slowed down. However, in China, we have a po huge population of 1.4 billion people, and every year we see an increase of employment need of 10 million people. That's in order to ensure that these additional 10 million people have Post every year and can be employed in market, you have to maintain certain speed of the GDP growth. So you 应该是个什么利益和可能出现的不利因素。Thus, we have to coordinate the so, uh, social development with the economic development. As we all know that China is making plans every five years, now we are in the period of the 17th five-year five plan. Every time when we make these five-year plans, we need to consider the economic growth and its compact on the society and the people. But let me ask you, and I'll go to His Excellency Lokan Sharma. Yes. Uh, if it is important, uh, as you all have mentioned, to balance economic growth with environmental social priorities. Uh, sadly, in some of the indicators, uh, like Human Development Index and GDP per capita, we're going to see Bhutan coming at the bottom. As you, as you recognize, there are some challenges. So how is Bhutan trying to account for culture, for a holistic view, along with speeding up also economic or, um, if I would say, uh, well-being in general? Well, <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, that, that there are challenges. Uh, anything without challenges who do not also provide us opportunities, 
then again we will we will be all good uh, therefore therefore anything has challenges uh, only thing is we pursue this nh model because uh, we find this model best for us by, by our location by our situation by the way we live by the way our society is there so this is uh, this is best and here when you say about all these things uh, as i mentioned those nine domains uh, under each there are all this uh, how to uh, human index uh, income uh, housing everything is actually embedded there only thing is that this is still uh, quite new and there are many variables being added deleted and the way of calculations and way of seeing it is still new that's one the other thing i would just like to tell you the striking ba uh, striking factor of bhutan is one bhutan is the only country which is i think uh, carbon negative whether we like it or not whether it is because of this or not i don't know but we are the only country which is carbon negative we are the only country that will remain carbon neutral always. I don't, uh, I don't say that we will remain carbon negative always, but at least carbon neutral, our constitution says so. We are the only country whose constitution requires that our forest cover should be 60% at least. We are the only country we have, which have given equal rights even to trees and forests because it's in the constitution if you see it, not only to the human beings. So we care about all the sentient beings, but the challenges are there. That is why we also have our economic, we are not saying we only have happiness there, only we pursue. No, happiness is something different. But that is a mission, ultimate mission, that's, that's how we want to go. That's a mission, that's a target that could be as constant as North Star. When we will reach, that is a different question. But beyond that, we have our own economic development policy. We have our own foreign direct investment policy, which is revised very recently. We have our own cottage and small scale in, uh, invest, uh, uh, industries policy. Uh, then similarly, uh, we work on, on, on digitization like any other countries. Bhutan has been seen as landlocked always. We don't want to be digital locked because landlocked is something we couldn't do anything about it. So, so very, you're very right uh, pursuing the social, uh, met, uh, psychological well-being, social well-being, cultural well-being only is not an, enough. Material well-being is also equally important. And we are not saying GDP is not important. And we are not saying that we don't want GDP. Still, we calculate our GDP is 2.3 billion US dollar. Our per capita GDP is 2,800 something. So we do calculate, but we are not driven by this too much. We are not driven by uh, the metrolic well, uh, uh, well-being only too much. We want to have others also there together. So everything moves parallel in holistic way so that we see equality, equity anywhere. Like uh, our, our, uh, this government, the current government follows narrowing the gap. We have seen over the years that that because of this economy and all things, what happened was there happened to be handfuls of very rich, but majority of masses couldn't catch up. So there is a widening gap in inequality. So now we want to compress this. We want to bring this. That is where we feel uh, everyone will be happy. Everyone will be better off. Uh, if not uh, few. So these are some of the policies we are pursuing. We have also same policies, same agendas like any other country. Great, thank you. So I think it's a very creative and innovative way, including, for example, as you mentioned, the rights of trees or the environment into the constitution, and that also puts limitations and informed policy. Uh, so Nabil Fani, can you tell me any innovative policies or things that you think uh, that are being done that push uh, to take into account the main challenges that Egypt is facing these days and put the focus not only on material well-being, but other issues that you care, other than education that you just mentioned. What are the other challenges that are faced now? Well, the challenges are, are basically the size of our problem. Uh, we're growing at 3% population a year, and we've been doing that for a number of years. So there is pressure to respond to the immediate uh, economic needs of the people. Um, if you look at our GDP, it's actually the largest increase in GDP among all the Arab countries, 5.6% this year. If you look at the Human Development Index, we've actually gone backwards because the problem of making sure that that income is going to the people. Uh, there is, as I said, a much more focus on youth uh, where both as a government, but also as a society. 
being tested between if you want to really go towards an innovative society, you need to push individual creativity and our more traditional conservative traditions of having a strong central government and uh, uh, equally so even in, in economic perspective. So I would argue that trying to focus on the future and relinquish authority uh, is really one of the challenges we have. We have successfully taken the policy decisions. In other words, we will try to give you a different education. We will try to focus on youth. We haven't yet dealt with the cultural aspect. And I say openly, that applies to government. One big issue is, do we decentralize or not? We're a big country. The problems of the South are different from the problems of the North, even though it is one country. Uh, and I think this issue of personal creativity and innovation is one of our challenges, really. Thank you. So, Ambassador uh, of China, what are, looking at the future, again, what are the main policy challenges being faced, and how are they being addressed in China these days? China的未来的挑战主要是各省市自治区要发展经济的同时要统一认识到对环境的保护这个重要性我们现在在地方上一些情况不一样因为中国比较大富也辽阔有三十一个省市自治区在内地发展的环境也不一样东部啊沿海地区发展比较快中西部发展比较慢所以怎么来有一个保护环境的这个标准大家都来遵守这是一个重要的方面。The challenge we face in China's development facing the future is to uh, reach consensus not only in the economic development, but also about the protection of environments. As China is a huge country, we have 31 provinces and uh, municipal municipalities, and we can see the even the level of development in China is quite different among different areas. For example, the eastern coastal areas are much faster in economic development, whereas the middle and the western part of China is much slower. That that's how to make the standard that's able to uh, that's able to be applicable for the whole country. This is the point that we need to reach uh, awareness and also consensus. So from seven years ago, the government led a big effort 那就是要进行处罚，严厉处罚。That's for the past seven years, we have established various inspection and surveillance group and send them to different areas of China to supervise the work in the protection of environment. If there is heavy pollution, the relevant party will be punished severely. 我们这个检查不是一天两天的。and the work for such inspection groups is not just for one day or several days. They actually will live locally for at least two or three months. Great. So I think we're going, we are seeing in, in, in the panel that we are all facing se several of, of similar challenges from uh, demographic shifts and employment or youth employment to environmental challenges to how we grow more, e more equitably, not only from, from different groups or social groups in the economy, but also at different regions or local, and how that material will be and can be spread throughout the economy. Uh, so I think I would like like a, a couple of sentences to close the panel and open the questions of how can we really measure what matters? You know, if we think that 
uh, GDP is necessary but not enough and we know that it's difficult and costly to come up with the right indicators. So how can we work together because indicators also need to be comparable. So we need to be able to compare uh, China to Egypt to Bhutan to Argentina and to inform policies. So w what are the two or three sentences where we prepare uh, the questions from the audience to close up? Thank you. Uh, I think uh, the world is already moving towards uh, as in, as in global village. Uh, everyone of us uh, together, everyone shares uh, similar problems. Uh, therefore, uh, but everyone also nowadays, uh, more and more, even the greatest economists or more and more people have come forward uh, that, that probably GDP, uh, the way we are measuring just the income, one plus one, two, it may not be enough. There are some things that move ahead beyond that and that is uh, not adequate. So a so lot of debates are going on. Uh, there are a lot of theories coming on beyond GDP, moving ahead, uh, human development index, uh, so many things. So, 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 so many scholars, uh, scholars, so many people are working towards it. And we also have this, Bhutan also have this GNH uh, index, uh, where as I already explained, uh, we have uh, variables, we have indicators, uh, we have domains, how do we calculate and how do we fit in, and all these also have. All of this, uh, we, should, we need to have more debates, uh, more thoughts into there, and then come out with some kind of uh, measurements or some kind of indicators uh, uh, which will be the best way forward. None of this singularly will be enough. Because today, why we are comparing like this probably is because we are basing subjective basis. Some that this system is best, and we try to measure other systems related to one fixed system. We are not being dynamic. Uh, we are not uh, looking from all the angles probably. So I would suggest that, uh, that what Bhutan has adopted, uh, I would not like to proclaim it is the best. But for us, uh, so far, it's working good. I would like to say that uh, Bhutan is probably one of the countries who has made uh, teachers at the highest pro paid profession very recently, if you have heard this. Uh, uh, because uh, it is not that, it's not pay only that matters, but we're starting to have where we invest in the future, in, in the children. And Bhutan has a maiden age of 27, and youth unemployment is also uh, a, a trouble for us. It, it is getting into their health. Bhutan, though, is a small country, resource constraint, still health is, uh, is all government, it, it is free. And we are reaching the health to the unreached. Bhutan has 99% of electricity coverage, more than 99%. We have only a um, th few thousands, uh, around 1,400, 2,000 households which are not covered. They are, they are going to be covered very soon. Okay. So things like this, uh, this is where the well-being of the people come. And then slowly, if you give them the opportunities, they will come up and they can be equal partners. Youths can be equal partners. Therefore, policies has to be framed in a way this applies to everyone. Uh, everyone. Okay. Therefore, uh, the GNH uh, principle or GNH index, I would not say that's the most befitting for today's world, but something is required than the merely mathematical calculations of GDP. Probably something has to be added there. Therefore, you're welcome to look into it. We are, we are here to uh, listen to you. We are here to work together. We have, a, we have miles to go before we sleep. Thank you. Excellent. Well, let me put it this way. I think it's important. All of the indexes just mentioned are important. Scientifically, they're indicative. That being said, for a developing country in particular, I would argue that the challenges shouldn't be evaluated on a one-year index, but rather on trends. Uh, are, is the education system getting better over a five-year or three-year? This is different from the plan. I'm, I'm looking at the actual measurement, because one year could differ from the, from the other. Uh, we, should, we should determine specific KPIs we're building for the future. We're not building for the past. So, and politicians have this tendency to say, well, we're growing now more than we did last year. But that's not the issue. The issue is, are you growing enough for next year? Right. And, and I would, the last point really is, and this goes also back to the point just mentioned, it's very important to engage your own constituency on policy issues. They have to be stakeholders accepting that we can't do everything all the time or immediately. So we will focus on health, education, or this or that. And these are the targets that we're trying to meet. If you don't do that, uh, 
governments are always going to be considered to have failed because people will not be satisfied. But I also think that if you can't get them to work with you, you're doomed to fail. Excellent. Ambassador? I'll just say it again. 就是我们呃制定 GDP 增长计划的时候，要考虑当代人的需要，也要考虑到后代人的需要。当代人的经济发展不能损害这个以后后代的经济发展这个环境。谢谢。I will share only one point that when we establish the plan for the GDP growth and economic development, we shall consider both the needs for the people at this generation, but we also shall consider the needs for ge uh, future generations. The development of current generation cannot prosper on the prices of future generations. We should prepare the environment and other respects for the future generations. Thank you. Excellent. I think it's an excellent moment to open the, to the audience, to the questions audience. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, thank, thank Good. First question, yes, madam. On the down left side in front, this is a very complex topic and it's good we can open it to questions and also testimonies if you have opinions or testimonies in your countries how to deal with the, this happiness question. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe question to the ambassador of China. Um, you we can have just heard introduce yourself. Anna Matevosian. Um, I'm a lawyer. Uh, we have heard about uh, social uh, credit system in China. Is um, happiness included in this system? And maybe question to Mr. Uh, Sharma, what do you think about the social credit system in China? Whether you think that um, happy behavior can uh, ensure higher uh, credit rating or it's more pressure for people maybe? Thank you. Are you asking him? I mean, first, Mr. Ambassador. Well, we are running pilot projects in the social credit system in China. And this system basically we record the incidents that goes against the public moral. I found that different views on the social credit system in China. Uh, and the divergence in such views are due to the misunderstanding or not understanding. First, I must say that this system is built on the protection of personal privacy. We will not go public of the individual privacy issues. For example, we have an app called Zhifubao, which is very popular now in China, but that doesn't mean that everyone can just see what's in that system for the information of different people. I'm not sure if I answered your questions or not. With the micro, please, yes, please. Whether uh, happiness of your population is also related to the behavior against the public moral you mentioned. 幸福感在不同的这个条件下，对这个幸福感的理解也是不一样的。The different understanding in regard to the sense of happiness. 我们要确保绝大多数人拥有幸福感，不是确保所有的人都有幸福感。We must maintain that the vast majority of the people have such sense of happiness, but we cannot ensure every each each and every one of us will have that. 任何社会，任何意识形态下。we can never ensure 100% under each, uh, every society or whatever ideology. 
，因为我觉得幸福这个这这个呃信用这个体体系的问题，我们这个高铁发展的很快，我们有些人没有买车票就坐在高铁上，这个不肯让座。我发现了这样的问题，他两年内他就不能坐高铁，这就是他的作用，确保了这个大部分的秩序呃这个高铁的秩序和其实大部分的这个幸福感。For example, China has been built the high-speed railway system. Uh, for the, but now we have a uh, rules that uh, uh, we found some people they will go to the this highway without buying tickets, or when they are on the train, they will not uh, let, for example, the senior people to have their seats. For these people, once they are recorded in the system, they will not be able to uh, buy the tickets and enjoy the benefit of the highway system for two years. And for these people, they may not be able to enjoy such so-called sense of happiness. But we will be able to maintain the majority of the people to benefit from this system. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Sharma. You. Thank you. Uh, actually, I would not, uh, it's not very wise probably to command because the social credit is that system. <laughs> and uh, whether, uh, whether uh, it will go right or not, probably they have, uh, they have re really seen into uh, it and they have embodied, but uh, the happiness should, ha should be there. Uh, because today, the moment you talk happiness, why people say, wow? Because I think somewhere, intrinsic value everyone would like to be happy uh, and happiness is something very intrinsic to everyone therefore if it is not that there should be but one plus one two uh, you can't have hundred every people if you try to ask are they happy sometimes it could be moods sometimes it could be momentary there are so many things uh, uh, related to it uh, but uh, with the world with the future going into artificial intelligence robotics probably we will go more mechanized more technicalized more scientific, the most emotional intelligence is a very important. Psychological well-being and emotional well-being will be very important. Therefore, it merits today to put happiness somewhere there so that future is still human beings there. Thank you. Another question? Just go. Yes, Mr. Monzoni. The micro, the first rank just in front of me from President Manzoni. Uh, I am very interested in trade-offs that can be made between various aspects that can be measured, right? When we only measure GDP, we have unmeasured trade-offs. But when we measure several aspects or several outcomes of governmental policy, then we can try to assess some of the trade-offs. So Ambassador Gang mentioned that, for example, one trade-off could be that we might invest less in some areas because it would increase GDP, but it will also increase pollution. And so for environmental reasons, we might not do some things. Another possible trade-off is we might not do something or we might do something to redistribute wealth between regions. So those are two trade-offs that have been mentioned. I am curious, Minister Sharma, if you have one or two other trade-offs that you could uh, share with us of decisions that were made by you and your colleagues where you said at some point, we're going to do this instead of that because if we do this, then these other measures are more likely to benefit. So could you illustrate one or two key trade-offs one immediately I can tell you is, uh, 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 I would rather go into, into a specific examples kind of thing so that uh, to understand the matter where. Uh, tourism, in Bhutan, what we follow is, uh, we try to say high value, low impact. That means, we have seen our neighboring countries, we don't want tourism so much so that we want to have uh, tourism to, uh, to make us so much money, but at the same time we have a problem with waste management. We are not able to give them exclusive and exotic destinations value for their money. Therefore, our trade-off is we limit number of tourists. That is a trade-off. The other is industrial development. We have four industrial uh, development parks. Two, we have committed to heavy or polluting industries. Two, we have committed to clean and non-polluting industries. We do understand this polluting and heavy industries would bring us more money, more employment, more money. 
But again, we are not only for that. That's why we are not only following that materialistic well-being because everything comes, they got done, everything will be fine. We'll have lots and lots of money. Probably I will have a bed where I can sleep with money and uh, have money on top of me, but will I be okay? Uh, so, so the trade-off I will give you, as an economic affairs minister, my trade-off is, I always say, let's do business with GNH. I try to meet traders, I make friends, and I try to explain them what does it mean. Let's do it in this way. The other example I can give is a personal example of mine. I'm a minister of Bhutan today. But if you come to Thimpu and see, I don't have a house. I don't have a house in urban area. Where I have a house is in one of the most remote part of my country. My parents stay there. They're still cow herders. I go to them at least twice to three years a year. In, enjoy there. I stay there with them. When I call them to Thimpu for medical checks, they might come and stay for a week or so. That they don't want to stay there. So this is my trade-off. I, 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 my trade-off is there. The, for, for, for taking this position, I've traded off with my parents. I, 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 I don't have any materials, but, but I have my parents. I love them. I want them every day, but I had to trade off because they can't stay with me in the urban areas. So these are some of the trade-offs we do every day. We do every day, and even in health. Uh, we provide health free. We reach to the most remote areas. It's very cost, costly, but there's a trade-off. We could have privatized it. Uh, we, we, we can afford to do, do it in some of the urban cities, but that's a, we are not doing it. There's a trade-off. For education, we used to give basic education till class, till 10th standard. From 11, they, there are certain cutoff point. We had a cutoff point. If they get above this, they go to the government schools, scholarships. If they get below this, no scholarship, no government schools, they find their own private schools, pay and go. But from this year, we removed this cutoff point. We said 12. What we realized is many of the poor people are not able to study till class 12 because they don't have money. So we have to pay money for them now. We are, we are, we are paying them for 11 and 12. We're giving scholarship to everyone till 12. That's a trade-off. We're losing money there. That's a trade-off because we're not making. We could have left it to the private players, but everyone is not able to afford it. So government is paying. Uh, in the private schools for them. So these are some of the trade-offs, very harsh, very hard, very tough trade-offs are there, when really you have to look into this, uh, this thing. Environment-wise also, our environment laws are very, very strict, very, very strict. Any industries cannot come there. So there are, there are quite a lot of trade-offs. But whether these trade-offs which we do are, you know, are OK or not, or fine or not? Are we going to miss certain things because of this trade -off? This is very important to realize, and these are country specifics too. For us, whatever trade-offs we are doing so far has done very well for us, and uh, we will continue to pursue the philosophy of gross national happiness. Any one of you, if you want to know what is it, how can we experience it, come to Bhutan. Bhutan is a beautiful destination for your investments too, because you don't have to pay for emissions. You don't have to pay for environment. You enjoy the free air without paying it. You might have to bottle it very soon in some of the countries. So please come there and invest there. You're welcome. Thank you. Just very, very quickly, this is an excellent question. Governments have to make trade-offs, but they're not across the board. I'll give you specific examples back home. Our government has made trade-offs with the rich, different from trade-offs with the less affluent in society. The industrialist, the government has invested heavily in infrastructure, but you build your factories. We're not going to give you subsidies and help you build factories, but we will build the road system and the communication system. So that allows you to be more efficient in producing the product that you're doing. Uh, versus the less affluent, the government has reduced subsidies, uh, food subsidies. It's floated the currency because it can't afford to cover all these costs. In exchange for that, it's increased, uh, it, it's targeting universal health care, a much more efficient universal health care system, and it's actually applied it in the pilot project in Port Said. And it's also, frankly, spending a lot of money on uh, regularizing, uh, what's, the, what's the best word for it? Uh, housing that's not legal. Uh, building low-income housing Farm. for people so that uh, they have basic needs. So that's a trade-off that, OK, you're, go you're going to have to pay more for your day-to-day -day projects, but we will give you the basic needs. 
and the same applies to education. While for the rich, you're still part of the country, you're, and we need you to be part of this. We can help you with the road system and telecommunication system, but we can't help you and give you benefits to build a factory uh, and so on and so forth. So the policy is all about trade-offs. Good. I think we're reaching the time uh, yes, to are. finish. And as I think it's a perfect question. So we know economics is about trade-off. We know the macro economy is a closed system, sometimes it's some zero game. But we have built, and especially by just focusing on GDP, a system that focuses only on material well-being while creating negative externalities for the environment, not caring about income distribution and, and about social well-being, happiness, culture, many of the issues that have mentioned before. I think what you have mentioned today and the examples that you have given us to a lot of food for thought is how can we start thinking about policies that start measuring the right things, that start measuring different things so we can do structural changes and we can decouple the way that we grow and the speed that we grow from the negative impact on the environment and society so these trade-offs are not as difficult in the past. And since I get the opportunity to close a little bit this part, I, want, I think this is in line of the World Competitive Center is doing. It's trying to measure and come up to measures that are necessary for policy decisions, for competitive and productivity, that are looking at to the future and not only to the past. So with this, I thank you very much for your generosity and ingenuity, and I leave you uh, with the closing of Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, so our panel. You can get back to the audience. We're arriving to the closing. Yeah, that's no problem. We're arriving to the closing remarks in a couple of seconds with Arthur Robes, who will join me. But before that, just a short wrap up of this day two in this video. The IMD World Competitiveness Center was created at IMD. Uh, it's part of IMD strategy, it's part of IMD portfolio. Thirty years ago, we felt that uh, it was difficult to assess the welfare of a nation, so we knew the GDP didn't tell the entire story. We knew that society was becoming more and more important in economics, and we knew also that uh, governments did matter. We didn't expect such a success. We didn't expect that it would take so much uh, interest by every party into this concept. Today, relative to what was happening in 1989, governments in the world realized that their objective is to preserve the competitiveness of their nations. I think it has been very interesting to summarize all important topics through the competitiveness of the countries and the world from different perspectives. And I think this is what we all need to listen to it more often. There will always be a place for competitiveness, always because we need to work to make the life of people better. That's it. A good index is an index that is used by anything but publicity. Uh, if cities are competing to get higher in the ranks to improve their uh, branding, it's not enough. It has to be a tool for reform, for change, for improvement. This is not about the infrastructure, it's about the use of technology. Competitiveness is uh, important to any country, any places, um, to create values for their people, uh, to improve. I think it is a concept which is going to last, there is no doubt, because today what we see is that actually government policy has more and more importance and that companies cannot ignore society and they cannot ignore governments. So they all come together in this World Competitiveness concept. I'm, I'm really thrilled with the outcome of these two days. I think for the first time at IMD, we have brought together our partner institutes from all over the world to talk, discuss, share, and to celebrate. And that's for me just a, an amazing achievement. Thank you everyone for being here. I'm going to take the stage for the last time uh, in this conference uh, to do three things. The first thing that I'm going to do is to summarize a little bit from my point of view what is the road towards competitiveness that we have discussed in here. But 
more importantly and in second place, I also want to list to you things that I have left unsaid or things that I wanted to discuss in this conference but which unfortunately we couldn't because we would need two weeks of discussions and we only had one day and a half. And obviously, finally, I want to give final acknowledgements to the people that have been involved in, in this conference. Um, to me, it is very easy to talk about the path toward competitiveness because this is what we discuss extensively everywhere we go. And my colleagues and I at the center, they travel the world just to explain what we believe competitiveness is. Um, the first ingredient that we need to be competitive is a country strategy. And I think we have discussed that extensively. A country strategy needs to be focused on the long term. But a country strategy is also about execution. Okay? Execution is extremely important. It is the same principle that we use with companies. Many strategies are well formulated but never executed. Many countries formulate good strategies that never make it to people. And I think execution is the second important ingredient in a competitiveness policy. Execution requires leadership. And I think political leadership was something that we have discussed and we have seen in the panelists that we had throughout all of these, all of these discussions in, in different topics. Um, and I would, I would add a couple of more things. A country strategy needs to be based on the uniqueness of the country. Professor Garelli said that extremely well earlier, is that we don't advise. We just tell countries what they do or we benchmark countries against each other. But we refused to go to a country and tell them this is the way how you should cook your salad. Every country should be able to cook its own salad. Okay? And I, I think on that front, I want to mention the, the topics or the themes that for me are extremely relevant, which are actually, I'm actually writing about uh, in what is supposed to hopefully be my next book. Um, Something that we have observed in, in competitiveness, or if you want mistakes that should be avoided. Number one, avoid consultants. <laughs> A very damaging, very damaging um, approach that many countries have followed in the last years is to rely on people that do not have skin in the game. If you look at the billions of dollars that consulting companies are making today at the expense of governments, it is reaching a level which is similar to the private sector. And the public sector functions in consulting companies have been growing exponentially. I see that as a huge mistake for two reasons. Consultants tend to bring off-the-shelf solutions and will recommend you the same thing that they are recommending another different country. I will use the same example of how a consulting company, which I will not name, recommended five different countries in the Middle East to invest in aluminum plants, arguing that this would give them a uniqueness. So when you have five unique aluminum plants <laughs> in a region, you're making a big mistake. Okay? But the second aspect that I want to emphasize that we haven't discussed, and many of our partner institutes have mastered, is that it is extremely important to brand the country. That is, Besides everything that we do, at the end of the day, marketing is very important. Bhutan does extremely well. Everybody knows about the Gross National Happiness Index. Okay? And that's extremely important as well because our work has actually shown that the best predictor of competitiveness in the long run is the image of the country abroad. So if you promote the image of the country abroad, even though it looks something that hasn't affect your people, it does. Because in the long term, it will attract investments it will, in, it will create jobs in the country, and investing in the image of the country abroad is extremely important. We have seen that in countries like South Africa, Thailand, Brazil, you know, many of these lessons that we have learned over the, over the last years. Um, what are the topics that, in my opinion, I, I, I noted them here, that, in my opinion, have been left undiscussed, which are extremely important? Obviously, I'm a finance guy. We haven't talked at all about financial markets. And we know that financial markets are key at developing economies. Okay? I thought it would be too biased to organize a panel of financial markets and maybe too boring. Okay? So, but I think it's important to, to mention that. Um, the issue of decentralization. To what extent certain countries, like for example Peru, Spain, or China, you know, are dealing with the optimal level of 
centralization or decentralization. Okay? Because here you see also two extremes. You have you see countries that decentralize extremely well, like uh, Switzerland. You have countries that centralize extremely well, France. And by the way, I'm saying something good about France <laughs> now. Okay? And then countries that decentralize, decentralize completely in the wrong way. One example is Spain, another example would be Brazil. We have actually experienced that. And other countries, for example, Peru is a good example, who is currently struggling with finding the optimal degree of decentralization. Okay, that's a topic that we have not uh, uh, addressed. The issue of small, small and medium enterprises versus national champions. Should we promote, from the policy standpoint, national champions, okay, like South Korea or Malaysia did in the early days, or should we promote small and medium enterprises as a way to create employment? Because at the end of the day, in countries like Switzerland, for example, 80% of the jobs are created by SMEs, not by large companies. And of course, the answer is that there must be an optimal combination of both. We can have a system in which you have large enterprises like Samsung, um, and South Korea is a good example, but where you, know, you also have small and medium enterprises that support the national champions. I wish you had discussed that as well in our, in our panels. And two, two more topics. Uh, the, the issue that we have found extremely relevant of innovation ecosystems. I wish we had, had discussed, for example, the success of innovation ecosystems in countries like Russia that is doing extremely well when it comes to bringing together talent, capital, talent, capital, and regulation which are the pillars of an innovation ecosystem. And then, if you go around the world, how some countries are doing that very well or not that well. Okay? Um, and finally, and that's the final topic that I want to highlight, is that I am extremely, I don't know if disappointed is the word, but uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sour feeling that Africa is not a big part of our ranking. The only African country that we have from, you know, from, especially from Sub-Saharan Africa in our ranking is South Africa. Okay? Uh, and I wish, not only in the conference, but in the future, as a challenge for us, we need to enlarge our scope to just cover more of Africa, because that's certainly the, the future of the world. I think that these are all the themes that I think need to be explored for the future. Uh, and I think, as Professor Gardelli said, competitiveness has been changing. You know, 20 years ago, we were talking about corruption, rule of law, investment in infrastructure. These are topics that have been already settled as uh, hot topics in competitiveness discussions. But I think these new topics, technology, gender balance, uh, the role of the image of the country and so on, I think need to be recognized. Okay? When it comes to also uh, things that have been left unsaid, I am also aware that there are some countries that we use as very good examples of competitiveness that are actually represented here that uh, we have not discussed. Because you know our, our 15 panelists throughout these days come from very interesting countries. Okay? But uh, I wish we had also discussed, and at least here, countries that are represented, Russia, quite interesting approach, especially to local politics in my perspective, Australia, okay? and our partners from Australia just flew all the way to be, to be with us, Mongolia, we actually, Mongolia, are very proud because it's the first country report that we ever work on at the center is for Mongolia. And Mongolia has on, has on very well how to use natural resources, in this case copper, for the advantage of people. Slovenia, our friends from Slovenia are here. And to me, Slovenia is a very good example of how a country that starts from a very harsh history tries to be like Switzerland, or at least ends up almost like Switzerland. Okay, from a country that was, of course, in a, in a different uh, economic, an economic block. Uh, similar to, for example, Malaysia. I think Malaysia was in my agenda to speak about public-private partnerships and the, the, the role of building bridges with the private sector. Okay? Uh, the Malaysia Productivity Corporation, for us, has been one of our most loyal partners. And we have worked very closely with them in the recent years. And I'm grateful for their presence here. Ukraine had the presence of the Ukrainian ambassador, and Ukraine is doing an amazing, amazing work in competitiveness in a very harsh political environment, as you can imagine, by focusing on innovation and focusing on technology, especially related to blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And finally, France, that we have already 
been discussing uh, and, and Belgium, okay, which is another country that you know very often we forget because we think that all European countries behave in the in the same way, and I don't think this is the case. So you know there are many things that are not in in our in our agenda, but I want you to know that they were in our mind when we designed this conference. Okay, so let me now go in the last. 40 minutes, because I have to give acknowledgements to so many people that it's going to take us 40 minutes to, to just uh, recognize all of the people that have made this conference possible. No, I will be, I will be much better. First of all, let me thank uh, Fatih Derder for being a magnificent uh, master of ceremonies. I think that you have brought together your expertise as a politician with your, with your, mind, your master, master skills, masterful skills in managing the audience. So thank you very much you. for your, for making this conference alive. Thank you very much. Okay. And, and I especially want to recognize four people for making this conference possible. First and foremost, my president, Jeff François Mansoni. As always, you know, I behave. Okay. But, but there are three people that are around the room that I want to recognize because without them, this conference would not have been possible. One is Drasen Raguz, who is there. You know, he's my big Croatian friend. Um, Clay Salves de Sousa, who is back there, who has worked days and nights to make this, this conference as well. And, and my colleague, Mael de Sar, who is over there, who has managed all the technology. Okay? But, and finally, I want, to, I want to make a public recognition here of the entire IMD World Competitiveness Center, because I don't know you have met them, but they have been with us for the entire, entire two days. And I want to make sure that you guys stand up and then we know who we are, okay? Um, Chief Economist, uh, Professor Christos Cavolis. Thank you, Christos. Our Senior Economist, Jose Caballero, is there. And then Miriam Sargari, Marco Pistis, Madeleine, Madeleine Hediger, Kat, Katrin, what is Katrin? Katrin Jobim, uh, William Milner, okay, but, uh, and I think I did I, and of course, I want to also recognize Max Harding for, us, for his work preparing the, the research briefing. They are all the current members. We're a very small team. So we work with all of you. And we're a very small team. And we want to thank all of our partner institutes for being here. I also need to recognize those who were here before us and who have been also part of the center that have been in the, in the audience. Christine Travers, who is sitting there. Okay. And, and Nancy Lane, who is sitting next to her, which are also previous members of the, of the center, as well as uh, uh, Karin Riedbeck, who I, I don't know if she is still here with us, but is a, another member of the, of the team, as well as Madeleine, Madeleine Linder, who was earlier before, as, as well as, I forget who, that was here earlier as well, that they have, they have left, okay? Uh, so these are the team that have made this conference possible, and I want to explicitly Thank them. So at the end, and this is the last thing that I, that I want to, ah, sorry, I forgot. No, no, I haven't finished yet. I have a long list. Um, I want to thank our, our uh, panel moderators, my colleagues, Tafik, uh, Mike, Didier, and Vavanina. Thank you very much for your hard work. Thank you. Um, and then the whole, the whole support team. Obviously, our communication team, who has done an amazing job. Uh, they, are, they are having all around. And finally, a special recognition to our technical team, pierre Alain and Nathalie, that you haven't seen them, but they are behind and have been made, I think they have been made this experience uh, completely seamless. Thank you all for taking such a long trip to come here, for your long flights and for your long trips or for your long train rides. Um, I hope we will repeat this, but we will repeat this in 30 years. Okay? <laughs> So most of you will be there because you are young, but certainly I will not be here because hopefully I will be retired by then. But see you in 30 years. So before we do that, a big hand for our two of you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. And see you soon. Thank you.